morning everyone. You're very welcome to join us um, and we are going to start this morning with worship and we're going to sing together, we're going to uh, just spend a moment focusing on the presence of God and recognising that he's here with us and responding to him. Um, and then we're going to have a couple of quick notices, the kids are going to go and sign into their group and then Maggie is going to preach to us this morning on our continuing sermon theme of discipleship, which is great. And before we enter into worship, I just wanted to invite Jeffrey up just to share something that you shared with me earlier on, which is great. Three, for the last three weeks when we first started worshiping, um, I, I stand at the back because I rattle around a bit. And um, as we started to worship, I saw Jesus come through, sense of the Holy Spirit, Jesus come through that door. I, the first week I thought, nah. But the second week, I thought, whoa. And the third week last week, I thought, wow. And that's Jesus, what it says, like somebody shared a prayer this morning, that God inhabits the praises of his people. So the Lord is with us. Amen. 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 So let's stand. Thank you. Amen. So Lord, come. Spirit of Jesus, we invite you to inhabit our praises of you. <laughs> Come, Holy Spirit. We recognize your presence is here already, but we ask you to draw nearer. We ask you to be present around us and within us. Because we want to glorify you and we want to enjoy you as you enjoy being with us. Amen. Jesus, 
Yeah. 
the mountains move We come with expectations We're waiting here for you Yes, Lord
clothed in the armor, the helmet, the breastplate, everything. But, um, you know, on, if you've ever been here for setup, we, we drag quite a lot of stuff into position on trolleys. And I just felt that Jesus was dragging this trolley behind him uh, with all the uh, armor that we would need on it. And we were just singing now about being empty-handed but alive in his hands. And I just believe as we, if we can wait on him just for a, a minute or two, whatever in, we need is there to give us the equipment. I did get the impression that was an awful lot of shoes. Um, now, I can't remember exactly the scripture. What is it about the shoes being fitted? Ready for the gospel of peace. And I think that's one thing that is particularly wanting us to have so that we can start sharing pe with people. We may feel we have empty hands, but if we receive from him, we'll have everything we need.
Jesus, you are so welcome here. We thank you that your presence fills your church. We love you and we give you our hearts and minds. We give you our lives as best as we can. We surrender to you. We choose to follow you. We choose to walk with you. And we choose each day to, to make a step closer to you and to give more of our lives to you. And we thank you that, that as we surrender, as we give of ourselves to you, that you give us so much more. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you're always drawing us into a relationship with you, that you're a God who reconciles, who, who redeems, who restores and recommissions us. But for now, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for the peace that I can see resting on people here now. And I bless what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a seat. <coughs> so much for worshipping with us today um, and we'll, we'll stay in a spirit of worshipfulness as we enter into the notices <laughs> which I believe yes, so um, this is a heads up for a week on Monday if I've got my calendar right, yes a week on Monday we have DIG our prayer meeting, it's come upon us quicker because we prayed at the end of our 21 days of prayer and fasting so that's good, we get to pray again and we love to do that, we pray all the time at all times, without ceasing, obviously, but once a month we like to get together and to pray. Uh, at the moment that's continuing on Zoom, so it means that um, everybody who wants to and can handle um, being online, I know it's not everybody's taste, but for those able to handle it online, uh, including our remote congregation, for those of the remote congregation, um, then we're doing that on Zoom, it's just an hour, 8 to 9 p.m. Um, it means that we can kind of get more people in the room than if we were just meeting together like that. So please do come along and, you know, pray every day as well. That'd be fab. Uh, next notice, please, Emily. Fabulous. Uh, just a reminder, uh, we've got our leaders meeting is this Tuesday the 15th. That's at our house at 7.30. Uh, so that's great. We're going to get together. We're going to um, be sharing what's going on in our groups and our ministries and um, praying for the rest of the church and everything is really encouraging and we'd love to see you there. Thank you very much. And uh, final notice, um, we have a set-up team meal coming up uh, this Friday the 18th. Ian, would you like to share anything? If not, do you want to just come up and look beautiful? <laughs> Maggie, <laughs> The only person that laughed at that was Maggie. <laughs> and Joy. <laughs> Inappropriate, I would say. So, um, just a brief uh, word about what's going on here. Uh, it's fantastic we've got this space to meet, to, work, to worship together, and uh, there are a few of us come together before the service and stay on afterwards to set out all of your chairs, make coffee, set out the, the welcome area, set out the kids' area, and so on. So if you would like to be involved, if you think you might even, mm, it might be something you want to do in the future, come to dinner and come hear all about it. Um, there's fantastic documents you can read. And we'd really like your feedback about what works, what doesn't, uh, what you need more instruction about, and how you need things to work. But please do, 7 o'clock, and uh, if you do want to come, please let us know, because I can have some food. Thank you. And if you can't make this Friday, but you are interested in getting involved, um, then please do chat to Ian or Joy and let them know. Um, just because I know there's maybe a couple of people who can't make that, but are still interested, so that'd be great. We always figure it's, it's really nice to hang out together, and actually when you have uh, a few hands, they all make light work, and we get to kind of hang out and do fellowship and stuff, um, which is always great, and really nice. So I believe that's all of our notices. Fabulous, thank you, Em. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take a quick two minute break while we get the kids signed into their group and then Maggie's going to come and preachify um, shortly after that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for the kids 
and then um, there's a chance for you to top up your coffee and grab another donut. Okay, so Lord, we thank you so much for uh, the kids and the young people in our church. We thank you that we have a place where they can hang out, they can build a relationship, and even as they're legging it now, we pray your blessing upon them, and we pray that they would have a wonderful time. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. So, um, I, I went on a little memory when I was writing this, when I was planning about this, and I was uh, thinking back, um, and maybe you could do the same, I was thinking back to my 18th birthday. Now, that was quite a long time ago for me, quite longer for some of you, and for some of you, yeah. um, no, I think everybody here is 18 or over, I think we've shoved them, Emily's nearly 18, but um, I was thinking back to my 18th birthday, and I can remember waking up on my 18th birthday, my mum bought me a cup of tea, and uh, I was like, oh, I'm 18, it's amazing. And I was a bit sad because um, Nick was up in Leeds and I was in St Albans. And I, so I was a little bit sad because we were 200 miles apart from each other. And, uh, and so I was trying to be really like, oh, it's just great, I'm so glad all my family are here. But in typical teenage way, really, I just wanted Nick to be there because that's what you like, isn't it, when you're a teenager. And anyway, the day went on and my family were lovely and we just had a really nice time. And then suddenly, Nick appeared. And what Nick had been doing for most of that day was hitching down the M1, as Nick used to do, he used to hitch everywhere, and he was hitching down the M1 to get to my house, or to get to his house, to borrow his mum's car, to drive to my house, to come and say happy birthday. And I didn't know he was going to do this, but Nick had a history of just turning up and hitching down to come and see. He used to turn up outside my school, and he would just be, I'd be like, what are you doing here? And he'd be like, well, I hitched. And um, anyway, on my 18th birthday, he, he appeared. And um, like most people on their 18th birthday, um, me and my friends decided that we would uh, go to the pub for my birthday. We thought, well, let's go, let's go to the pub and surprise the landlord by now being legal. And yes, the landlord was quite shocked and was quite cross with me. I'm not going to, like, seriously. I'm like, I'm really sorry, but you fell for it. But anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> really sorry. So we decided we would go on a bit of a pub crawl. And... Um, in my group of friends, there were some of us who were Christians, and there were a fair few who were not. And one of my friends with us um, had a very serious illness and had been given overnight release from hospital. She was in the, the Royal Free Hospital in London, and we had, me and my friend Sarah had kind of gone up there and sweet-talked and got her an overnight release, which was, we were quite proud of, so we could take her to the pub. We might have left that bit out of our, our begging to the doctors, but anyway, we got her out for the night. And uh, we walked into town, and uh, as we walked into town, we happened across a church meeting, which I confess I knew was happening, but anyway, so we happened across a church meeting, and um, we were invited in, as I thought might happen, and uh, for some reason, and I cannot really tell you why, everyone decided this would be a really good idea, and I still can't quite get my head around that, there was about ten of us, and they all went, yeah, all right, yeah, we'll go in, and we were on our way to the pub. And it's her birthday, but yeah, yeah we'll, we'll go to a church meeting. It was really, really strange. And um, it was uh, the summer of 1994. Um, so some of you might be thinking, oh, I know why that church meeting was happening. 1994 in the summer. Um, so a little bit of background. I grew up in a Catholic home. I came to personal faith when I was 13 through an amazing Catholic charismatic youth group run by a community called The Upper Room. Absolutely amazing people. And I was no stranger, therefore, to the Holy Spirit. People spoke in tongues. Um, I had occasionally fallen over in ministry. Sometimes it was God, quite often it was me, just going, oh, I'll, I'll fall over to them, all that kind of stuff. And it was, it was um, a really exciting time for me um, just to take responsibility for my own faith, my own walk with Jesus, and to just to kind of... Um, Still really loved my Catholic roots, but embrace, you know, all that I felt God had for me. So anyway, in we all went into this meeting, and uh, what transpired kind of blew everyone's mind. And we actually didn't really get to the pub until nearly closing time, so it was quite a weird birthday. But um, by the time we turned up, in what can only be described as kind of like a Acts of the Apostles thing, we all seemed quite drunk anyway, by the time we got there. We were a bit like this. <laughs> None of us could walk straight, and most of us were talking drivel. Um, but we hadn't actually had anything to drink until we got to the pub. Because the meeting we went to was in the throes of what might be called the Toronto Blessing. And for those of you who are unaware of this incredible move of God, it was a time of renewal and a blessing of the church. Now, some people during this time did some pretty weird stuff in churches. Some of it of God, some of it not. 
And, um, you know, I still have a scar on my foot here. From, um, I, I went barefoot a lot at that time, being a bit of a hippie goth. I went barefoot a lot, which was a bad idea in a meeting where people were pogoing up and down in the Holy Spirit, and a woman in high heels pogoed onto my foot. Yeah, I know, you're all cringing. Yeah. But every time I look at that scar, I go, God's real. Well, that woman was mad. <laughs> One or the other, I'm not sure. But we were all utterly blown away by God at this meeting. And the reason I'm telling you this is my friend with the illness who we kind of got, got out of hospital, she walked through the door and she immediately hit the floor and then stayed there for two hours. Two hours. I was like, seriously, it's my birthday, mate. Come on. Two hours. She was on the floor, did not move apart from the occasional sort of wiggle and um, laughing a lot. She was doing lots of laughing. Um, a lot of my friends started laughing quite uncontrollably and were meeting Jesus really powerfully for the first time. Or they were shaking in a way that I couldn't believe. And I'd been going to church where this kind of thing had been happening, um, but I didn't really think it would happen to my friends on my birthday, my friends who didn't believe in God. And it was a wonderful demonstration of the kingdom. You know, God's power was tangible. And of course, some people made stuff up. Of course they did. I mean, you know, some people, people made stuff up, but people were healed, lives were changed, and it was really exciting to see this demonstration of God's power. But what always stayed with me, apart from the scar on my foot, um, was how each person felt loved by God. They felt known and loved in his presence. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of them, um, you can find it, this book, you might just be able to see it. Um, it's a book called uh, Everyday Supernatural, and if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's by Mike Pilavachi and I think it's Andy Croft. Um, it's a really, really good book about the everyday supernatural. And one section that resonated with me as I read it was their observation concerning Moses and God's glory. And it reminded me so much of that moment right back in 1994 when my friends experienced God in such a powerful way that even those who don't walk with Jesus now, because, you know, they didn't all stay that place, they still can't really explain what happened, and we call it that night. And they just kind of think, remember that night? And they're like, yeah, you can have it every day if you want. But, you know, we'll see. So in this um, little observation, um, Moses, who has met God through the burning bush, he had seen Egypt covered with plagues. He'd seen the Nile turn to blood and even the sun blotted out. He had seen a sea part and manna fall from heaven, water spring from a rock. He'd been led every day by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. He had received the Ten Commandments, broken them, gone back and got another set. And I love that bit. And he'd spoken to God face to face. And what does he ask of God at the end of all that? He says, show me your glory. <laughs> I think, wow, bare face cheek. <laughs> it's like, God, you've done all of that. Could you show me your glory? And in Exodus 33, 19, we have God's response. I just love it. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And God's glory and his power is awesome, and it is ultimately revealed through his goodness, his mercy, and his compassion. That's what it's revealed in. You can have every jump up and down experience that you like, but if the person doesn't walk away feeling loved, if they haven't experienced the mercy and compassion of God, then it's just jumping up and down. Pilavachi says, he says, a true revelation of God's glory, a genuine miracle, a real act of supernatural power will cause us to wonder afresh at his character, his goodness, mercy, and compassion. And sometimes when we're trying to work out, was that God or was it not God? I just sit there and think, you know, look at, the, look at every interaction Jesus had with people. And you see that goodness, mercy, and compassion again. Think of all those stories, you know, the... Um, the woman at the well, or the woman with the hemorrhage, or the man with the withered hand, the paralysed man. I'm just doing Mark's Gospel now. I'm going to descend into Mark's Gospel. It's going to become a GCSE lesson. I've gone from Joel. I'm, I'm lurching into Mark here. But um, just all of those things, those people 
walked away from that, being known and being loved. So when we consider God's power through the miraculous and the supernatural, through gifts and experiences, we should remember that the result of Jesus' miracles wasn't simply that people were awed, or not even just that they were healed, but that they were loved and they knew it. So every act of physical healing, every act of forgiveness, every action that addresses poverty is a foretaste of God's kingdom that will come in fullness one day. God's kingdom has broken into this world, it is breaking into the world, and it will break into the world one day. It is that now and the not yet of the kingdom. And the kingdom of God is that dynamic rule and reign of God. It comes from that word basileia, it means rule and reign. And throughout the teachings and actions of Jesus, we can see this rule and reign is present and demonstrably active. And in Revelation 11:15, we can read of the day when all creation, the world will see and acknowledge Jesus' reign. It says, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Amen. But until then, there remains this mixture of good and evil that we all experience and we are touched by. So Jesus' kingdom is present now, but present in what would seem to be a broken and maybe evil world. And Jesus spoke about this in the parable of the weeds in Matthew 13, if you want to look it up, please do. Um, he explains that in this world, at this time, good and evil exist together. But as I was explaining to somebody this week, that might be true, good and evil exist together, but that doesn't mean good doesn't exist. Don't just look at the evil. There is still the good. So we're kind of living in this time between times. It's like um, between the inauguration and the consummation of the kingdom of God. And we as human beings live in this tension. And it is a tension. It is hard to live in a tension between the kingdom touching us now and the kingdom that will be fully revealed at the end of time. So sometimes there is healing now and sometimes there is not. Now George Eldon Ladd, I remember having to read him for doing my A-level in theology. I remember sitting on there, I was actually coming up to Leeds to visit Nick on the train, and uh, I, was in, I was in the quiet carriage because I was pretending to be deeply theological and do my A-level RS homework, and I was reading George Eldon Ladd like a right weirdo on this train, everyone else is, you know, just like chatting, and I'm going, a very, very in-depth theological book off, and it's in Greek, like that, which I couldn't read. And um, anyway, he said this really simple phrase, he says, we live in the presence of the future. That's what we as Christians do. We live in the presence of what is to come. And that is why we can pray for healing. And we hope for it, and we pray for it, and we'll, be, we'll take a risk and we'll step out and do that. But not every person is healed every time this side of heaven. So what does it mean for God's kingdom to come now? Well, whenever Jesus taught, signs and wonders followed him. He preached the kingdom and he demonstrated the kingdom. So children were raised from the dead, lepers were cleansed with their diseases, and the lame walked. The blind were given sight, multitudes were miraculously fed with small amounts of food, prostitutes were shown mercy and kindness, arrogant religious leaders were rebuked for their lack of compassion, the poor were treated with dignity as fellow image bearers of God. Women were afforded equal dignity as men, compassion shown to beggars, to thieves, to drunkards. I'm using biblical language there, I possibly wouldn't use that language myself these days. But that is what it looked like. His demonstration of the kingdom, yes, it would be in these people being raised from the dead, but it was also about affording dignity to people and loving people and showing them compassion, getting the hands and feet dirty and getting down to where people were and walking with them through their hardness and their difficulty. It was about finding the image of God in every person. That's what Jesus did, every person. And this truly was God demonstrating his glory. So just back to that verse again. The Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So we see Jesus' power over the demonic signaled God's invasion of the realm of Satan. That's what it did. His power over disease bears witness to a time when all suffering will cease. 
His power over nature, stilling storms, pointed forward to the complete victory over the evil powers that use nature to threaten the earth. His absolute authority over death points to the day when all day, all death will be done away with. But it didn't stop there. It doesn't stop with Jesus. He started a kingdom apprenticeship. So it's a bit like a bit like a BTEC in following Jesus, you know, get an apprenticeship or a T level, as they're probably going to be called now. Jesus commissioned his disciples to go and do the same things that he was doing. And I was watching that film Risen. I don't know if some of you have seen the film Risen. Um, it's an amazing, amazing film about um, a Roman centurion who is tasked with finding the body of Jesus after, after the crucifixion because rumours of his resurrection are rife and it's going to threaten Roman power, but it's also really irritating the Sanhedrin and the Jewish powers. And, um, and he has to try and find this body, and he's going bonkers trying to find this body, and then suddenly he finds Jesus, and he's like, I don't know what to do with this information, and it turns his life upside down. And in that film, you see this amazing bit of these disciples just going, we've got to tell people, and like, they're practicing their spiel. There's one bit where one of them, just after um, the ascension, he's, he's on the beach, and he's He's like got some people around him and he's talking about Jesus and he's going, ah, la, 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 Jesus got me, la, la, la. And his mate comes on and says, you need to go. He goes, yeah, that was quite good, that one. I might save that. I might use that one again. And you can just kind of see them practicing, preaching the gospel and going, oh, that's good. Yeah, keep that up. That works. So they were going to proclaim and to preach and to demonstrate God's rule and reign. And sometimes we elevate these people into experts and they really weren't. They were trying it out the same as everyone else and trying to get the words right. They had walked with Jesus physically for three years, slight advantage, I suppose. But they were working um, with, with their, working with their obedience. The Holy Spirit extended the kingdom into people's lives. I don't believe Jesus ever meant for miracles to end with him. Because why would they? Because we're living in that tension. We still need glimpses of the kingdom. So this ragtag band of fishermen and tax collectors and Jewish laymen were participating with Jesus in the revealing and the demonstrating and the preaching of the kingdom. So every miracle, every act of justice and compassion was pointing to the future day when God would completely set the world upside right again. I love that phrase, set the world upside right. That's what God would do, upside right. He would fix things in the future. And this presence of the future that Lad was talking about was truly upon them. The kingdom was near and they're participating in this amazing restoration project. And God acts in healing and power and deliverance still today. The kingdom apprenticeship that Jesus started has never stopped and it is an open invitation to every single follower of Jesus. And what do followers do? They follow. That's what we do. Followers follow. That's, that, that's our job. We follow. And we follow the one, and then we play, you know, a bit of Simon Says, really, more like Jesus says. But we do what he says. And I, I wonder how that makes you feel. Um, I, I have various responses to this at various times. Sometimes it makes me feel really excited, really eager, nervous, sometimes a bit terrified, quite often inadequate, sometimes offended. Sometimes it's offensive, isn't it? It's like, yeah, but I don't, I don't like that person. They're, they're, they're rude and they're unkind and they treat people badly. I mean, I've, I've got to go and demonstrate goodness and mercy and compassion to them. And Jesus is like, yeah, find the image of God in that person. Go for it. So perhaps also in the past, maybe you've been prayed for and maybe healing didn't come. Maybe it was physical healing or emotional healing or mental healing. And maybe now you're skeptical or confused about this kingdom. You know, why didn't God do that? And maybe the thought that God could and would use you to pray for the sick or to give a word of encouragement or a prophetic word is maybe just a step too far. The idea of laying hands on a person and risking a prayer maybe sometimes feels a bit too much. Perhaps you think that that's the leader's job or somebody with one of those special anointings. You know, there's people with special anointings. In some churches, they have to sit on the front rows, the special anointings people. Uh, we don't do that. If that ever starts happening, I'm going to start removing the front rows and then you'll all be on the front row. Uh, we, we, we don't do that. We, we don't do as some people are better than others. It's just nonsense. Um, I say respectfully stepping away from the theology of other people, but um, I don't agree with that. So maybe you disqualify yourself from doing the stuff you might just be too tired. Let's be honest, we're all a bit tired, aren't we? You might just be too tired. But today might be a really good day to allow God to speak to you about that, 
allowing God to speak to you about that fear or that worry or that decision that you've made about you and who you are. Because I suspect God's original design for your life did not include a portion called inadequate for ministry. I, I don't think he designs people with inadequate for ministry as part of their nature. I don't, I don't think that's how it works. And sometimes we expect God to prompt us to move in the miraculous and in big and dramatic ways, but I think it's always just an invitation to trust and to take a risk. And in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, which I can do as a song in the style of Elvis, which one day I will find for you. It's got actions, it's amazing, but not today. In the Great Commission, Jesus is giving a very clear directive to his followers. So this is the Great Commission. So basically he's saying um, Jesus has um, all authority and power. And uh, he says, I have all authority and power and I'm in the presence of the kingdom. He commands us to go out in his name and to make kingdom disciples. He says he will be with us as we do this so that we have full access to his kingdom power and his authority. And if he says it, he says it. He has all authority and power. He is the presence of the kingdom. He commands us to go out in his name and make kingdom disciples. He says he'll be with us as we go and he gives us full access to his kingdom power and authority. So then at Pentecost, this ragtag bunch of disciples, at Pentecost, the kingdom of God creates the church through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the church becomes the primary, although not exclusive, residence of God's rule. And this means that the church witnesses to the kingdom of God. It is an instrument of the kingdom of God. So the church should show goodness, mercy, and compassion. And if the church is not showing goodness, mercy, and compassion, then it's not showing God's kingdom. It's not showing God's glory. And so as such, we are called to proclaim and to demonstrate this. So in Luke 9, it says, when Jesus called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. It's quite straightforward, isn't it? And then in Acts 1, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, if we were hoping that those 12 disciples were going to do the entire world all by themselves, I think that's a little bit harsh. I think we're being invited to take part in this. We are part of to the ends of the earth. That's what we're here for. And we are given the power and authority and this power is from the Holy Spirit. So the power is the ability and strength and might we need to complete the task given to us. And I think we're all quite aware of that. But what about authority? Authority is the right to use the power. In this case, the power of God. Now this is where I find it slightly intimidating. We are given the power of God and the right to use it. Me. I mean, I'm just me. So John Wimber, in his book, Power Evangelism, gives a really helpful analogy to help us understand this dynamic, and it looks like this. It's quite short. He says, a traffic officer does not have the physical power to stop cars. However, the officer does so because of the badge and uniform given by a higher authority. We have been given the badge and authority by Jesus, and we need to learn to wear it and use it effectively. I cannot by my own power, heal cancer. I cannot, by my own power, rid someone of a demon. I cannot, by my own power, bring salvation, the greatest miracle of all to someone. Yet by God's power and God's authority that he's given to me to use it, I can participate in the kingdom and the apprenticeship stuff. I can do the stuff. It may be that the healing comes, it may be that it doesn't, but I will pray nonetheless. I will. And as long as that person walks away feeling loved, and no, that's okay. That's okay. Robbie Dawkins puts it like this. Well, Robbie Dawkins terrifies me. He's, he's an amazing evangelist going out praying for people, but oh, that's scary. He says, we serve the one true God and stepping out to do kingdom things is like having a front row seat. It's not that we have to be amazing. It is that he is amazing. That's the power of our testimony, that God would use broken, hurt, wounded, messed up people like us. That's part of the gospel message. It is this picture. So whenever you're praying for someone, or whenever you're there going, I, I don't have the solution to this, I cannot do this, 
The authority is given to you. You're operating someone else's power. Ellie Mumford often says, and you have all the resources of heaven to meet the needs of the people in front of you. All the resources of heaven to meet the needs of the people in front of you. And I, 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 I sometimes, I repeat that to myself. I go, okay, all right, Lord, I'm, I'm starting to think maybe this is about me and it's not. It's about, am I wearing that badge of Jesus and am I operating out of that? Now, over the years, I've heard many, many, many different models for praying for signs and wonders. And many have real merit. There's lots of, if you say this word at this point, then this will happen. It doesn't always seem to work that way. But unless I understand and accept that I have the authority to use the power of God, it's all a bit pointless, isn't it, really? I've kind of got to accept that God will use me and that he has said, I will give you the authority to do this. We are not the kingdom, but we are instruments of the kingdom. The works of the kingdom are performed through us. We are like midwives of the Holy Spirit. But we, we, we can't breathe. Our purpose is to witness about what God has done, is doing, and will do. Now, a few years ago, I was asked to speak at a church in Leeds um, on this topic, and I was given the prompt, what excites me most about the kingdom is. And I spent a long time thinking about that, and uh, I had a post-it note on my office desk with it written on, so that I could consider it regularly, and... Um, just wrote loads of stuff down. I was like, what excites me most about the kingdom? And I was like, oh, is it raising the dead? Is it this? What's the most exciting thing about the kingdom of God? So in the end, I rested on this. What excites me most about the kingdom is everybody gets to play. Everybody gets to play in being a kingdom apprentice, in demonstrating God's goodness, mercy, and compassion to a growing world. We can lay hands on the sick, serve the poor, bring hope to the lost. Everybody gets to play in being an instrument of the kingdom. And I think that is what excites me most. But then we think, well, how do we do this? First of all, and some of you might need to do this little bit of work with God today, understand and accept that you have been given power and authority. Maybe be honest with God about yourself and your fears, and allow God to touch that part of your heart that you might have said, no access. Maybe step out in small ways, practice sharing words or, or godly impressions with uh, those in your small group. Maybe be available to God and God moments and promptings. If someone is telling you that they are ill and you have a nagging, I probably should offer to pray thing going round in your head, Perhaps take a risk and say, I can pray with you, this is the key word, right now. Because if you just go, I can pray for you, they'll go, oh, thank you very much, and then they walk away. But if you go, I can pray with you right now, most people go, would you? Even my atheist friends go, really, would you? I'd really appreciate that. <laughs> it's so much fun. Perhaps read about how to e exercise the gifts of the spirit. And you know, that book, um, Everyday Supernatural, is a really good place to start. But you know, more than anything, be filled with the Holy Spirit. We are filled as believers, but we leak. We, we put down God's authority, pick up our own, which quite frankly is a bit rubbish in comparison. <laughs> and the great thing is, God will fill us again. So let's, we're going to take a moment now. We're actually just going to stay seated for a moment. Just stay where we are. And then I'm going to press Nick's music again if I can work out how to do it. I just want us just to sit. I'm going to invite the Spirit to come. And if you feel God's Spirit moving on you, just stand up. And then the rest of us, I'm going to pray for you. And if we're all stood up, amen. Let's see what happens.